Uh, hello. Uh, yes. Uh, thank you. And um, uh, welcome to everyone uh, who has joined in on the WebGen seminar. Um, really glad to see over 100 participants here on Zoom and I'm sure a lot of people on the YouTube live stream as well. Uh, so I will just say a few words about the WebGAN series. Uh, perhaps some of you have already been to, uh, uh, to these sessions before. We, uh, we have been trying to get some of the top scientists in India and around the world uh, to come and uh, communicate some of the um, the cutting edge science and the uh, and research, medical research, as well as um, uh, basic biology uh, on, uh, uh, on the COVID uh, and related issues. Uh, and um, I, I think this uh, has been uh, very popular. And uh, please do tell your friends uh, who have missed this talk that they can also watch the recording. These are put up on the COVID Gyan web page. Uh, this is covid-gyan.in. Uh, so COVID Gyan is an initiative that uh, has been uh, spearheaded by uh, some of the country's best institutions in the sciences, um, specifically TIFR, Tata Institute of Fundamental Research and all its centers, including those in Bangalore, like the NCBS, the ICTS, where I'm from, and uh, others in TIFR Hyderabad, Homi Baba Center in Mumbai, and the TIFR uh, Kolaba campus, uh, together with IASC from Bangalore, um, India Biosciences, um, the Tata Memorial Hospital, uh, and uh, several other partners. Uh, so it's a unique pan-institutional initiative and the uh, scientists and com science communicators and uh, uh, others have come together in this venture to communicate uh, accurate, reliable information on the COVID, uh, COVID uh, uh, epidemic on a number of different fronts. Uh, we have been concentrating a lot on communicating some of the, uh, the scientific advances. And you will see many articles on our webpage which uh, try to uh, give an accurate picture of the developing uh, understanding of uh, this virus and the infection. Uh, mm, uh, there's all, there are also other resources uh, on the covid webpage, uh, webpage, which, uh, which include um, uh, infographics, uh, various videos, as well as um, uh, resources on uh, well-being uh, at such a time uh, and so on. Uh, we have content in about a dozen Indian languages and uh, the content is expanding. We are trying to, uh, uh, to have an almost exact mirror of our English language website in uh, many of these uh, regional languages. Uh, to improve our um, uh, reach. Uh, and I would really appreciate people going and taking a look at it and also telling uh, their uh, uh, spreading the uh, spreading the word about COVID Gyan in their circles. So uh, with this, uh, let me uh, let me also extend my thanks to Dr. Shahid Jamil for agreeing to uh, give this webinar in this series. Uh, and um, uh, I will hand it over now to uh, Professor Sandhya Kaushika, who, has, uh, who had been for, uh, uh, for several months leading our content team at COVID Gyan and uh, contributed enormously to the content there. So over to you, Sandhya. Thank you, uh, Rajesh, and thank you, Shahid, for agreeing to give this talk. Shahid, to the biology research community in India, needs no introduction. He's currently the CEO of the Wellcome Trust uh, DBT India Alliance uh, funding agency. But in his scientific career for over 25 years, he was a virologist and worked on hepatitis E, on HIV, and he even has a couple of papers on uh, coronavirus. So I thought, um, I have heard other webinars in which Shahid has been part of, and he's been very much in the forefront of explaining the science to the general public. And I thought it would be a very good addition, not only because of his long contribution to virology research, um, but also as, a person who has been at the forefront of sharing current understanding with 
people who are interested in science and but are not experts. Thank you, Shahid, and the floor is over to you. Thank you very much, Sandhya. Uh, pleasure to be here. Uh, and unlike uh, most of the talking I'm doing these days, uh, which is to uh, really lay audience, I'm hoping that this is a more scientifically inclined biology, maybe not exactly biology inclined, but at least much more than what I've been, people I've been talking to uh, on, on other uh, platforms. So what I plan to do is to uh, firstly show you about an eight or 10 minute clip. It's a YouTube video which beautifully explains the basic concepts of the biology, the immunology of uh, COVID. And then I will come in and uh, tell you a little bit about the global situation, the situation in India, where the outbreak is heading with, with some you know, facts and figures. And then I will come in to, to talk about the immunology of COVID, especially some recent uh, work that has been published, uh, which has implications for uh, the uh, immunity and has uh, implications for vaccine development, as also understanding the pathogenesis of the disease. Uh, and then uh, we'll end by talking a little about the vaccines that are under development. Uh, so I'm going to share a, a YouTube video. Uh, in case uh, uh, you're not hearing the video or not seeing it, uh, just alert me in the chat box so that I may not be able to hear you in the background. Of okay, so let me start sharing the screen. I assume you can see the screen? Yes, we can. Okay, so let me play the video. This is Professor Kiko Iwasaki. I'm an immunologist. I often hear questions like, what is the difference between antibody and immunity? With the help from BioRender, I've put together Immunology 101, tutorial for non-immunologists. The immune system protects the host organism from invading pathogens like viruses, bacteria, fungi, and parasites. To do so, the immune system employs two layers, the innate and adaptive immunity. Innate immunity acts within minutes of infection to remove the pathogen. This is a nonspecific short-term solution. In parallel, innate immune cells induce activation of adaptive immune system. This takes a week or two to get going, but once established, the adaptive immunity provides long-term pathogen-specific defense for the host. So let's dive a bit deeper. Innate immunity starts by detection of microbial pathogens through sensors that detect unusual molecules or activities, known as pattern recognition. Once microbial patterns are detected by these sensors, they trigger immediate alarm through secretion of cytokines and interferons. Cytokines and interferons bind to their receptors on various cells around them to help put up guard against further invasion. They also induce death of infected cells so as to stop further spread of the virus. Finally, interferons and cytokines also induce another set of signals that flag white blood cells to be recruited to the site of infection to wall off and attack the invaders. However, when cytokines are triggered without breaks, they can cause damage to the cells responding to the cytokines and shut down the function of the organs. This is known as cytokine storm, which mediates severe disease, including COVID-19. During SARS-CoV-2 infection, the virus infects and replicates in the lung epithelial cells. The virus is detected by macrophages through pattern recognition receptors, which trigger the secretion of interferons and cytokines. 
However, this virus appears to be oblivious to the interferon's antiviral effects. Instead, the cytokines recruit more white blood cells to swarm the tissue, creating cytokine storm, where many cells contribute to the secretion of lots of different cytokines. Some of these cytokines include those that induce fibrin deposits, as well as damage the blood vessels for fluid to leak out into the alveoli, causing respiratory failure. Viruses block the secretion and function of cytokines and interferons so that they can replicate and spread by evading the host innate defense system. When this happens, the body starts the second layer of immune system, the adaptive immune response. The T and B lymphocytes, the key players of adaptive immune system, require education by dendritic cells. Dendritic cells are specialized white blood cells that survey the tissue for potential pathogens. Once dendritic cells detect pathogens through their pattern recognition receptors, they not only secrete cytokines, but are also signaled to migrate to joining lymph nodes. Naive, uneducated T and B cells sitting in the lymph nodes interact with dendritic cells. If their receptors happen to match the antigen presented by the dendritic cells, they become activated, expand, and become so-called effector lymphocytes. These effector lymphocytes migrate back to the site of infection and directly kill infected cells and block further viral spread by secreting specific antibodies. These specialized white blood cells, T and B cells, are called into action by antigen-presenting cells. Once they reach the target tissue, T cells trained into killer soldiers, detect specific virus fragment on the surface of infected cells and destroy them, eliminating the source of a viral factory. Antibodies secreted by B cells bind to the surface of the virus and block their entry into host cells. These are called the neutralizing antibodies. B cells also secrete non-neutralizing antibodies that call in other white blood cells, such as natural killer cells, to kill virus-infected cells. Natural killer cells are professional killer cells, but need guidance from antibodies to target their weapons against the infected cells. What's cool about the adaptive immune system is that both T and B cells become memory cells and provide immune defense for a long time. Memory T and B cells survive for years and are able to defend against the same pathogen during second exposure, much better than the untrained lymphocytes. So the second time you encounter the same virus, your memory B cells will quickly stimulate to produce much higher levels and quality of antibodies. Similarly, memory T cells provide quick and robust protection especially if they are within the site of virus entry. Some B cells become plasma cells, which secrete tons of antibodies for years. If you were vaccinated as a child, you are likely to have antibodies to the vaccine antigens decades later. Antibodies will bind to the invading pathogen immediately and block their further spread. Serological assays detect the level of antibodies to various pathogens and is a good indicator of your previous exposure to pathogen or vaccination. How long the antibody lasts depends on the type of pathogens. For measles, antibodies last for decades. For common cold coronaviruses, one to two years. However, you still have memory B cells and T cells that can reignite antibody and killer cells during the second exposure. You're still much better off than when you were naive to the pathogen. However, the safest and the most reliable way to achieve immunity is through vaccination. Vaccines are designed to trigger robust and long-lasting immunity superior to that achieved by natural infection. It is the only safe way to develop herd immunity. Herd immunity refers to the protection achieved 
at the population level if enough people are immune to a given pathogen. For highly infectious virus like SARS-CoV-2, majority of people in the population must be immune in order to confer protective herd immunity against those who are not yet immunized. There are over 100 vaccine candidates against SARS-CoV-2. We hope that some of these will provide durable and effective immunity, mediated by both antibodies and T-cells, to help us stop the spread of COVID-19. Thank you for listening. Okay, so I... I... Hearing, still hearing something in the background. Um, we, we are not hearing anything, Dr. Shahid. Yeah. Let me see how I can stop the feed here. Okay, I will, let me share my other screen. Can okay. you see my slides now? Yes, we can see the slides. All screen right. Here. With your playing in the background. Okay. okay. And um, as I mentioned, you ask questions in the chat box if you do have any or in the QA. Like there's another video playing in the background. Can you guys and, hear that? Um, yes. uh, you will probably have to close All right. The I'm going to get started. And Brigitta, Francesca, maybe you can just let me know if you can. See I don't see it on my screen here. Really at a loss what I should do. Maybe close all the browser windows. Okay, got it. Now you should be able to see my screen, right? Yes. All right, wonderful. Uh, sorry about all that confusion. So uh, hopefully uh, you got the basics of uh, the immune response to any virus uh, and a little bit about herd immunity and uh, vaccines and all. So let me start talking about the situation with, uh, with COVID uh, and the, in the world and especially in India, in the States, and then go on to some of the immunology. All right. So uh, that's the situation of the outbreak now. Uh, we are looking at about 15.2 million cases around the world. Uh, with about 623,000 deaths across the world. And the little dots that you see are uh, the, the red dots tell you about the 
intensity of infection, the density of infection around the world. Uh, and there are a couple of very striking things here. So for example, look at the striking difference between US and Canada, for example, next door neighbors. Look at how little infection one has so far seen in Africa, for example. Uh, India, of course, has a lot of infection. Western Europe has a lot of infection. US has a lot of infection. And parts of uh, Southern America, especially Brazil, have a lot of infection. The world map with the uh, yellow dots uh, tell you uh, the active cases. And the active cases essentially replicate the total cases. The, world map with the white dots shows you the incidence of infection, which means that the rate at which the infection, uh, I'm sorry, the yellow one is the incidence of infection, uh, which sort of mimics the, the total numbers. And the white one tells you the case fatality ratio, uh, which is how many people uh, are dying out of people who are confirmed to be positive and there again, you will see that most of those white dots are in the Americas and in Western Europe. Uh, the intensity of those dots in South Asia, Southeast Asia, Africa is, is rather sparse. And I'll come to that uh, you know, towards the end. Sorry to so, interrupt, uh, Shahid. Yes. Could you make your full? Could you make it slideshow mode? Sorry, the zoom are here. I was trying, and it was oh, uh, not you know, it was not moving. There was okay. a freeze frame. Fine, no problem. No problem. Yeah, we tried this earlier. Uh, I could try and increase the size. Uh, anyway, let's not uh, play with it too much here. If you're able to see it properly, then it's I, fine, I think it's I'll fine. stick to No this. problem. Yeah. Okay. So these are the numbers as of today. Uh, you will see that India has uh, roughly uh, 1.24 million cases. Uh, the number of people in India who have died of COVID confirmed deaths is somewhere around 30,000, 29,800. Uh, and there are a few other columns here that you should pay attention to. Uh, now, one column is about the total cases per million population. And the other is the total deaths per million population. And you will see that in India, the denominator is rather big. So these uh, values are small. So roughly we have about 900 cases per million population and about 22 deaths per million population. It is this number that is often quoted in government circles that India has very low uh, number of cases uh, compared to its population size and deaths compared to its population size. And that is true. On the other hand, the same sources will tell you that India has done uh, 15 million tests. Uh, and use that as an argument to say that we are testing enough. But again, if you look at the test that India is carrying out per million population, same metric as the cases and, and deaths, you will see that again, we are testing about 10,000, 11,000 per million population, which is one of the lowest in the top 10 countries outside of Mexico, which is about 6.6,000. So uh, I think it's important to look at data, uh, look to, to compare uh, data which is comparable uh, and, and not cherry pick data, uh, say one thing for cases and deaths and another thing for tests. So that's something I have wanted to highlight here. But nevertheless, the fatality in India is much less compared to uh, the other top 10 countries. But this is not something that is true just for India. If you look at fatality rates across South Asia, if you look at fatality rates across Southeast Asia, parts of Africa, you find the same thing. And I am arguing that among other things, there is a biological reason for it as well. 
I don't subscribe to the theory that uh, there are there is underreporting of deaths. Uh, and the logic is very simple: that if it was underreporting, if if anyone was fudging data, then everyone in these countries must be fudging data, and everyone one must be fudging data to the same extent, which is unlikely, not possible. Okay. So keep keep that in mind. Now, uh, another question which is often asked is, was the nationwide lockdown successful? And if you recall, we went through four lockdowns, a uh, total of 68 days, I believe. Uh, so the, the graph on the left tells you what worked in the lockdown. And this shows uh, the doubling rate of the outbreak uh, plotted uh, against time and the different lockdown periods have been indicated. So there was a very sharp drop in the, uh, or rather a very sharp increase in the doubling time uh, or decrease in the spread of, uh, of the virus uh, during the first lockdown. And then things sort of started trailing off in the second lockdown, third lockdown, fourth lockdown. Uh, and that really is a very sound argument to unlock because the lockdown was really giving diminishing returns. Uh, we went from uh, about a doubling rate of 5.5 days uh, at the start of the lockdown. And by the time the lockdown ended, we had come to about 16 days uh, doubling time. Today, the doubling time is somewhere around 22, 23 days, uh, or maybe in the higher 20s. Uh, so it's, the, the point I'm saying is there was a sharp drop and then things started leveling up. But what, uh, what didn't work? We uh, brought in the lockdown very early. We brought in the lockdown uh, when there were only 657 cases in the country and 12 deaths. By the time we ended the lockdown, we had almost 200,000 cases and roughly 5,400 deaths. Today, the outbreak is growing at the rate of uh, about 4%. Uh, and we are adding roughly 38,500 cases per day on a seven-day moving average. And there are about 700 deaths per day, again, on a seven seven day moving average. So uh, by no means is the outbreak under control. The outbreak is still growing at a fairly alarming rate. If you're adding 4% per day, uh, you can calculate where we will be in two weeks time, in four weeks time, if this trend is not reversed. But then when we talk about India, we cannot talk about India as a single unit because uh, India is really a mixture of metro cities, big cities, small cities, uh, villages, and different states have different dynamics. So things work a little differently. So let us look at the state of the union. And the graphs here really show you in different states, what is the status of the outbreak? And this is daily cases. Uh, plotted against time. And you will see that perhaps the only state that seems to have reversed the trend over the last uh, three to four weeks shown here is Delhi. Everyone else seems to be increasing. There are some states that uh, did very well uh, early on, uh, but are, you know, Bihar, for example, you can see here, we don't know whether it was less testing or whatever it was, but Bihar has a very, very steep rise uh, that's happening now. There are other states like Punjab, for example, shown here, which, show, which brought down the infection quite significantly, and then it has taken off again. So maybe we can call this the first peak and we can, or whatever is coming, we can call it the second peak. So the patterns differ from one state to the other. Uh, at this time, there are five states that are mainly responsible for the increase in numbers. 
Maharashtra, Tamil Nadu, Karnataka, Andhra Pradesh, and West Bengal. And these are the approximate numbers. Remember 38,000 being added per day. These account for a large majority. Uh, let us skip this. This just shows some numbers, not very important. Now, uh, let's look at four cities our four metro cities, Delhi, Mumbai, Chennai, Bangalore. Delhi, as you saw earlier, for the last three to four weeks, it's on a downward trend. And this trend is real because the pressure on hospitals in Delhi today is not as much as it used to be uh, maybe three weeks, four weeks back. Mumbai has sort of leveled off. It's not increasing, but it's maintaining that level so a constant number of cases are being added on a daily basis. The outbreak isn't really going down in Mumbai. Chennai seems to have reversed it slightly. Uh, and, but in the last uh, week or so, you will see that it is starting to level off. Whether this is a new uh, equilibrium for Chennai or it will go down further remains to be seen. But look at what Bangalore is doing. Bangalore was doing so well till about mid-June. And since mid-June, it has simply taken off. And uh, it's looking rather alarming uh, right now. The effective reproductive number in an outbreak uh, is essentially measuring how many people on an average are infected by one, one infected person. And if that number is greater than one, the outbreak is expanding. If the number is one, then it is at an equilibrium. If it is less than one, the outbreak is dying down. So this is the data for Delhi. Uh, Delhi started off pretty high, but uh, you know it has hovered around uh, one. And for the last uh, couple of weeks, the, it's, it's gone down below one. It's actually about 0.89 or something like that. So Delhi is definitely showing uh, a reverse. Let us look at the COVID deaths. Uh, Delhi may be out of the woods, but Delhi is still having a lot of deaths per million population. If the national average is uh, roughly 20 or 22, Delhi has roughly 200 deaths per million population. It's still pulling at about 10 times average. Uh, and there are various other states that are pulling higher than uh, the national average, Karnataka, Tamil Nadu, Gujarat, and Maharashtra. I told you about Bihar. Uh, look at the curve in Bihar. You know, it's really taken off in the last few weeks. And the slope of this curve is really, really alarming. Uh, the national average is about 4%, 4.1% increase per day. Bihar at this time is increasing at the rate of about 10% per day. And the death rate in Bihar uh, is also a little higher than the national average. The death rate is also rising at a rate of about 3.2% compared to the national average of 2.4%. And I put this graph over here purposely to show that Bihar has been testing the least. If you look at tests per million population, Bihar is doing only 3,000 tests per million population, whereas uh, you know many others are in the range of about eight to 10,000 or more. Uh, so what I'm arguing is that as you start testing more, you will see more. And unless you test, you won't know uh, how to trace and how to isolate. All right, one uh, other question that is often asked is where did this virus come from? Uh, we have all heard of these conspiracy theories that it came from a lab, uh, but let's look at it logically. Before this coronavirus, there are four other coronaviruses shown here that are endemic in the human population. And they contribute to roughly 20% of the common cold that we get, the beta coronaviruses. 
in 2003, we had emergence of the SARS virus, which jumped from bats through civet cats into humans. Then 2012, we had the MERS coronavirus, which again jumped from bats into humans through camels. And now we have uh, this virus, which has the maximum sequence homology to two bat viruses that were isolated in Eastern China in 2018. And it also has about 90% homology to a coronavirus, which was isolated from pangolins, which is a scaly, small scaly mammal. So the current thinking is that uh, this virus jumped from bats, maybe through pangolins or maybe not, uh, but it has taken its time to evolve in the human population. It was sort of under the radar and after it has acquired certain key mutations, uh, which enabled it to transmit very efficiently, it has uh, really taken off in the human population. The only data we have is from December 2019, but perhaps if we can find archive samples before that time, we'll be able to see an earlier progenitor of this virus. Now, why do I think that this virus actually came from bats and not from a lab? If, if as a virologist, I was trying to develop a virus to infect humans and to cause disease in humans, I would not use a virus as a backbone that had no history of causing disease in humans. And that is the 2018 bat virus. I would have much rather taken the 2003 SARS virus, which is present in many countries around the world and engineered it to make it more pathogenic. That simple logic, uh, which many people who have these conspiracy theories seem to be missing. Okay, let me not say more on that. What does this virus look like? Uh, it's an enveloped virus, meaning that it has a lipid envelope around it. And in this lipid envelope are embedded three kinds of proteins shown in the schematic here. The red one is the spike protein or the S protein, which is a major component of all the vaccines that are being made. And it's been shown that antibodies that are neutralizing bind to a portion of the spike protein. Besides this protein, there are also a protein called the membrane protein and another protein called the envelope protein. The virus is uh, about 100 nanometer in size. And the inside of the virus is a 30 kilobase RNA, which is a positive sense RNA, meaning it's a mRNA sense. It can directly make uh, proteins. And this RNA is wrapped around uh, another protein, which is called a nucleic capsid protein. <clears throat> As I said earlier, the homology, the highest homology is to the bat coronavirus, about 96%, about 91% to pangolin virus, only 80% homology to the SARS-1 virus, 55% to the MERS virus, and about 50% homology to the common cold beta coronaviruses. On uh, the replication time scales, uh, the, the virus seems, and this has been de de deduced from other coronaviruses, uh, not from the SARS-2 virus. Uh, these viruses seem to take about 10 minutes to enter cells. They have an eclipse period, meaning the period they spent inside the cell multiplying, that's about 10 to 12 hours. And the burst size, which means how many viruses are produced per cell is roughly a thousand virus particles are produced from each infected cell. Uh, each ML of sputum contains about 10 million virus particles. And this brings us to this whole issue of aerosol transmission. Uh, we understand that the the, the, the aerosol contains big droplets as well as very small droplets. The big ones carry the most amount of virus and those are the most infectious. And those are the ones that drop very close to where they were released and they largely contaminate surfaces. 
the small ones which travel much farther also carry very little virus. So while theoretically it is true that the virus can be transmitted through aerosol, the chances of you getting the virus and getting proper viral load from the aerosol is very, very low. You do much likely to be get to virus in this contact or from uh, surfaces. All right, <clears throat> let's look at uh, what happens. Uh, so the, initially the viral infection starts in the upper respiratory cavity, which is the nasal pharyng nasopharyngeal area and the throat. Uh, it initially replicates in these areas. And if in most people, it is controlled in this area and doesn't move into the lungs. Only when it moves into the lungs, it causes moderate to severe disease, which requires hospitalization. Uh, so uh, if that is what a healthy alveolar uh, sac looks like, uh, the infect, the virus can get to the lungs and infect the alveolar sacs. And this, as you saw in the video, attracts an immune response, which means that neutrophils invade uh, other uh, uh, immune cells invade. And in this fight between the virus and the, the immune system, uh, there is some damage done to the vesicles, uh, the blood vessels, as well as the air sac, which leads to fluid accumulation in the lungs. And it is actually this fluid accumulation that leads to oxygen deprivation and in severe cases leads to uh, really uh, what is called, called acute respiratory distress where people have to be put on forced ventilation. So that's really what it, it does to your lungs. As long as it is, it is uh, restricted to the upper respiratory cavity, the virus doesn't cause uh, lethality. Uh, there are essentially three phases in respiratory viral infections and I, not particularly this virus, but I'm talking about most respiratory viruses. You have a pre-symptomatic phase, a symptomatic phase, and a recovery phase. Viral replication starts in the pre-symptomatic phase. And this is a crucial difference between the SARS-1 virus and this virus. In the SARS-1 virus, the uh, virus shedding was seen only in the symptomatic phase. Whereas in this virus, the shedding is seen up to uh, three or four days before symptoms appear, which essentially means that people can be uh, sort of uh, throwing out this virus and transmitting it without even knowing about it. And that sort of explains why this virus has uh, infected over 15 million people in such a short time whereas the SARS-1 virus could only infect about 8,000 people around the world. Uh, so following the viral infection, you first have an innate response, and it is largely this innate response that controls the viral infection in the mild phase of infection, mild symptomatic phase of infection. And most people who go through it uh, go through this phase. However, cellular responses are also picking up and the cellular responses finally control the virus. But in some cases, these cellular responses go completely crazy. A uh, lot of cytokine is secreted, which comes to be known as cytokine storm. And this leads to severe disease. The humoral response, which is the antibody response, starts picking up during the early symptomatic phase becomes positive around a week to 10 days for symptoms and then carries on for variable periods of time. And I'll come to it uh, a little later to, to show you data uh, of you know, how antibodies wane off with time. This is the phase in which antivirals work. This is the phase in which the immunomodulators or the therapeutic antibodies work. And uh, as you know, there are uh, 
two immunomodulators available now. Uh, one is called tocilizumab and the other is called etolizumab. Uh, and they both uh, really target uh, the cytokine storm and keep, keep cytokines low. Therapeutic antibodies, and this is where plasma therapy comes in. Plasma therapy is based on passive immunization, meaning that take the plasma from people who have recovered, they carry antibodies to the spike protein and use that to block you know, virus entry and therefore replication in cells. Uh, you have already seen the human response and I know, don't need to go over it just to say that there is the innate response and then there, are, uh, there is the adaptive response which includes uh, B cells that are converted into plasma cells, which make antibodies. And then the other arm is when antigen presenting cells present it to uh, uh, pre present uh, the, the, the virus to both uh, uh, CD4 lineage and CD8 lineage cells. The CD8 lineage cells become affected T cells and kill virally infected cells whereas the CD4 lineage cells help the development of B cells into plasma cells. So they, all, they help in the uh, antibody response as well as help in the uh, development of the effector or the killer T cells. Innate immunity to the virus is important uh, and there are multiple points uh, that it's, it's a very well characterized pathway and I'm not going to go into the details of the pathway, simply to say that it is based on sensing molecules, it is based on signaling molecules. And at the end of it, uh, the type one interferon and type two interferon genes are activated. Interferons are secreted. These interferons will go and bind to neighboring cells and prepare those cells uh, to inhibit viral replication. But viruses also have mechanisms to evade innate responses. And there are multiple steps shown here in red, which have been worked out for other coronaviruses like the SARS-1 virus, the MERS virus, where viral proteins are able to uh, sort of uh, short circuit the uh, innate immunity at certain points which does not allow enough uh, interferon to be produced and then the virus can uh, proliferate uh, quite nicely. But there are uh, proteins discovered from the SARS-1 virus which are also able to inhibit the JAK-STAT pathway uh, and that leads to the uh, suppression of interferon stimulated genes which would have controlled the virus in the infected cell. So it's a tussle going on between the immune system and the virus. Now let me show you some, some recent results. Uh, so uh, a paper in BioArchive in, in the middle of April showed that it is the receptor binding domain in the spike protein that is required for developing neutralizing antibodies. This is a monomer. The red area is the receptor binding domain. And if you look carefully in this primer, you will see red, uh, yellow, and orange uh, uh, side chains. These are essentially the RBD coming from three different monomers to form uh, a pocket. Uh, when mice are immunized, they, with the RBD, the receptor binding protein, they make anti-sera. And when this anti-sera was tested, people saw uh, increasing uh, response uh, with, with, the, uh, with the immunization days. Uh, so essentially, uh, antibodies to the receptor binding domain are able to neutralize the virus in vitro. On the other hand, if you start look at patients, and this is a paper that was published last week, uh, uh, came online in Med Archive, when they looked at, when they evaluated the, uh, 
neutralizing antibody responses in patients, they found that uh, the, these antibodies decline uh, in about three to four months uh, post onset of symptoms. Uh, so essentially you see this line and don't worry about the scatter because he says patients of different severity. Uh, so the take home message from this is that if you are making antibodies to the receptor binding domain of the, of the spike protein, those antibodies are neutralizing and protective, which tells you what you should be looking for in the vaccines that are being tested. But the note of caution is that neutralizing antibodies wane off in about three to four months in patients who have undergone an infection. Now let's look at, uh, let's look at T cells. Uh, and uh, in, in this study, which was published in Cell, uh, again, uh, very recently, uh, show that, uh, you know, measuring the immunity to the virus is, is of course really a key to understanding uh, vaccine development. And when people took uh, small epitopes, uh, small peptides to map CD4 and CD8 uh, positive T cells, they could show that there, were, there was 100% positivity uh, in convalescent, uh, uh, in, in people who had recovered from infection and roughly 70% uh, reactivity in COVID patients. Of course, it varies between uh, people. The other thing that was noticed is that the T cell responses are focused uh, not only on the spike protein, but also on the membrane, nucleocapsid proteins, and some other proteins that are produced during viral infection. So if one is using a uh, a vaccine that contains only the spike protein, the T cell responses are going to be limited. That's one take home lesson. Uh, but interestingly, T cell reactivity was also seen in people who had ne who never had a SARS coronavirus infection. Uh, and that was very intriguing till a paper came out uh, again very recently in nature, uh, which, has, which has shown that uh, actually you can get antibodies. So they measured the T cell reactivity in three types of people. People who had SARS coronavirus 2 infection, people who had SARS 1 infection in 2003 and had recovered from it, and people who had no evidence of either SARS 1 or SARS 2 infection. And they could find T cell reactivity in all of these three, which essentially means that T cells acquired 17 years ago in the SARS-1 infection, there is still memory. And in those people who were never infected, this is coming from the other beta coronaviruses that cause about 20% of uh, common cold every year. So this speaks very good for T cell control and for a memory recall in people who have received uh, vaccines. So even though the neutralizing antibodies may go down, but the understanding is that when these people are challenged with a fresh infection, they will very quickly raise uh, both antibody and T cell responses and control the virus. Of course, this is an this is an experiment which you can't do, but uh, you know, based on uh, based on data, this looks good. Now, uh, two or three studies have looked at really the immune response in totality by doing uh, you know microarray you know profiling kind of kind of experiments. So this paper that came out in in mid June. Uh, well, took only three patients. One uh, had, uh, you know, mild infection, one had moderate infection, and the other had severe infection. 
And basically the outcome of this work is that uh, the early immune response in patients is highly dynamic. Uh, the most of the pro-inflammatory genes, except the interleukin-1, uh, were induced at a time when respiratory function really was at its lowest point uh, or when the oxygen requirement uh, was maximum. And that reduced T cell activation uh, was seen in mild cases, and this may contribute to the prolonged detection of viral RNA, which has been seen uh, in, in many, many cases. But a more comprehensive study just came out uh, you know, last week in science where they have done uh, really deep immune profiling, both of uh, whole blood as well as cells by flow cytometry, uh, looking at multiple cellular subsets. And Based on this analysis, and this, this was done in about 125 patients, so it's a really large study. Uh, it showed that patients show very heterogeneous immune response, uh, while most patients will show a CD4 and CD8 uh, uh, cell activation and proliferation, and also a plasma blast response, meaning uh, B cells being converted into plasma cells, but roughly 20% uh, of patients showed minimal uh, T cell activation proliferation and uh, plasma blast response. So based on a very extensive profiling that I'm not going into, uh, they found that there were three different immunophenotypes of uh, COVID patients. The first immunotype had high CD4 cells. CD8 cells could be high or could be exhausted. And there was a plasma blast response, uh, but the plasma blast response was essentially linked to a type of CD4 cell which has a transcription factor called TBET. Again, let's not go into it. And these were the patients who showed the most severe disease. The second immunophenotype was people who had CD8 effector cells, meaning killer cells had developed. They had less of a CD4 response. Uh, and there was a plasma blast response, which was linked to a type of T cell, which is a proliferating T cell uh, having a, a marker called KI67. Uh, and these produced memory cells and these memory cells uh, hopefully could be induced in uh, a later infection. And the third immunophenotype uh, was based on undetectable or low lymphocyte activation. Remember these 20% people who had minimal response. Uh, so these are people who just failed to mount any immune response. So this was really a mixed phenotype. Uh, they, in general, there was robust plasma blast response. And in sometimes uh, people had up to 30% of their B cells were, uh, of their plasma blasts uh, reacted to the SARS-CoV virus, which is very, very high seen in uh, some other infections like Ebola, for example. And also that some patients show prolonged uh, strong T and B cell responses. And these are the patients that show a cytokine storm. So essentially this paper now uh, has provided markers by which people can be classified. And in, in a sense, you, you could start uh, you know, better clinical management based on this kind of uh, studies. So now let me shift gear and tell you a little bit about uh, the vaccines. Uh, there are essentially four or five types of vaccines that are being made at this point. The easiest vaccine to make is a whole virus vaccine. And a whole virus vaccine could be either an inactivated vaccine or a live attenuated vaccine. The example of an inactivated vaccine is the one that ICMR and Bharat Biotech are making in India, which is, and the way it is made is you grow up the virus, you purify the virus away from the cells on which you have cultured it, 
Uh, so essentially you purify it away from all the cellular debris, you inactivate the virus with some chemical, essentially formaldehyde, and use that as a vaccine. A live attenuated vaccine, which an example would be the live polio vaccine, the pulse polio uh, virus. Uh, these vaccines are uh, generated by passaging the virus uh, multiple times or lately uh, by genetic means. And a company called Codagenix is developing a vaccine you, based on a strategy which is called uh, I'm uh, uh, codon deoptimization strategy, which is a very very new platform. This vaccine hasn't not has not come into into humans uh, yet. It's in preclinical stages. The second type of vaccine is the genetic vaccines, which is based on which is either a DNA vaccine or a mRNA vaccine. Uh, DNA vaccine again, the example in India is the Zytus Cadella vaccine, uh, which has gone into human trials in India which essentially puts the spike gene on a plasmid, delivers the plasmid, and lets the cells take it up and make the protein. The mRNA vaccine is you know, the famous Moderna vaccine, which was the one that first went into humans. This, instead of putting DNA, it makes an RNA. And this synthetic RNA is encapsulated into a lipid nanoparticle, and it is delivered uh, to cells through an injection. The third kind of vaccine is a viral vector vaccine. And examples of this are the uh, Oxford vaccine, which is based on a chimpanzee adenovirus. The other example of this is a Chinese vaccine, which also published results uh, early this week, uh, which is called the Can Sino Biologics vaccine. And both of these are now in, in phase three trials. And there are other platforms people are using Adeno associated virus, VSV, measles virus, all of that. And finally, you have protein vaccines or subunit vaccines, which either make soluble proteins or virus like particles in which there is no nucleic acid there and use this. And typically, this would be the spike protein of uh, the COV2 virus uh, used, as a, uh, used as an antigen. This is the status of the trials at this point. Uh, there are about 135 plus vaccines that are at preclinical stages of development from the lab to animals. 15 vaccines have gone into phase one. 11 vaccines are in phase two, four are in phase three, and one vaccine has received uh, provisional approval only for very limited emergency use. Uh, so I'm not going to go into the details of which vaccine is where. At this point, there are essentially three or four vaccines globally that are front runners. You have the Moderna vaccine, which is now in combined phase two and three. Uh, we have the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine, which uh, is also in a combined phase two, three. Uh, we have the uh, CanSino bio vaccine, which has received limited approval to be used only in military personnel in China, but this is undergoing large scale uh, phase three testing right now. Uh, so essentially these are the vaccines that are, are you know, the front runners. Uh, in India, as I said earlier, we have two vaccines. One is the Bharat Biotech ICMR vaccine, which is a whole virus vaccine, which has received approval for phase one and two, and they just started. And the second is a DNA vaccine, which uh, Zydus Cadella is uh, making with support from BIRAC and Department of Biotechnology, and that has also received approval for phase one and two trials. Both of these will take roughly three months uh, for these trials before they go into phase three trials. All right, uh, herd immunity. Well, herd immunity as a concept essentially means that uh, how many people in a community have to be protect, have to, uh, you know, be either infected or vaccinated to protect others who, continue to remain susceptible. 
And if you look at data from around the world, uh, the places that have had the you know, highest density of infection, places like New York City, London, Madrid, all of them show uh, you know, less than 20% of the population to have uh, IgG. A zero survey just came out from Delhi, which shows that in about 21,000 people in Delhi, you have uh, roughly 22, 23% IgG. Uh, people advocate that India should go for herd immunity. And I've done some basic calculations here to show that the kind of, if we go for herd immunity in the short term, the mortality is going to be quite high. And this is not something that uh, really we can justify. Having said that, it's herd immunity that will eventually control the virus, whether vaccine derived or community derived. Uh, but then we need to flatten this curve and extend the period in which herd immunity is acquired to a longer period. Otherwise, fatality would be too high. Uh, that's the Delhi C zero survey. Let's not uh, talk about it, except to say that if the results of this zero survey and another zero survey, which was done by ICMR in the end of April, if the numbers are true, then we are already uh, looking at something like 15 to 16 crore infections in the country already. Uh, these are some infographics that we have prepared at India Alliance. We have a resource hub on our website you can go and download anything you want for free. And these infographics are present in multiple Indian languages. So please use this as a resource material. Uh, finally, I'll end with some key messages. Uh, for us, I think it's very important to follow government and WHO international guidelines. Each one of us needs to behave as an infected person for us to protect those around us. Uh, which means that everyone needs to wear a mask in public. Uh, so far, evidence shows that masks are your best protection. And if everyone wears a mask, then everyone is protected. But it's important that everyone wears a mask correctly. You wear it on your mouth, you don't wear it on your chin, which I've seen a lot of people do. There are many myths that have floated around. I have not talked about it, but if anyone is interested, we can talk about it in the Q&A. Uh, bottom line is don't wait for a drug or vaccine. The vaccine trials have progressed very well at this point, but we are not there yet. And making vaccines for the world is and delayed to the end. Uh, so we have to break transmission now. And finally, since I'm talking to a group of scientists, say uh, COVID-19 has really shown the value and return on invest science. And all of us need to be advocates of this. All of us need to remind our NMs and policymakers when this is over, how science is the one that helps them beat this disease. Uh, so I, I would really request all of you to become advocates uh, of science. So, so that's it. I will stop and uh, I will take any questions. Then. Thank you, Shahid. That was interesting. And, uh, you know, it was good that you sort of gave us that overview of what's current understanding of T and B cell responses in uh, people who have been infected and who have not been exposed. So let me start off with uh, something that you have spoken about in the press and I think bears discussion here and you mentioned in the talk. You think that there are biological reasons for the reduced deaths, that the reduced rate of deaths that we see in India. Um, what do you think are the biological reasons and yeah. How do you place them in context with the fact that even across India, you have different percentages of deaths compared to one state versus the other? Sure, yeah. Uh, if you look at the case fatality rate in India, and if you also look at the infection fatality rate, which has been calculated through these zero surveys, 
our infection fatality rate is somewhere around 0.08%. Our case fatality rate at this point is roughly uh, 2 point some percent. Uh, it's roughly 22 per million population. But uh, I would again remind that this case fatality rate is not just for, this low rate is not just for India, all of South Asia. Pakistan is probably the highest, nearing the high 20s, nearing 30, but everyone else is below 20. Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Nepal, Bhutan, Myanmar, sorry, uh, Philippines, Thailand, Malaysia, Indonesia, Singapore, everyone is below 20. Uh, so I, and this is, this is uh, really, I mean, I'm, I'm, guessing, hypothesizing, that there are a couple of things that are happening here. One is that we are exposed to a lot of other infectious diseases, including viral diseases. And therefore, we have a much stronger innate immune response, which controls the virus very early. It controls it in our upper respiratory tract, doesn't let it go to the lower respiratory tract, which is where you see uh, a lot of the case fatality. The second, I think, factor is that in all of these, this area, South Asia, Southeast Asia, you have a relatively younger population. And if you stratify the fatality by age, you will find that the maximum fatality is in people who are 60 or above. Uh, Seventy-five percent of India's population is less than forty-five years of age. Uh, so that may be another factor. On the other hand, there are confounding factors. India has a lot of diabetes. India has generally poor levels of nutrition. So it is possibly a complex interplay of uh, some of these things. But the data which is out there cannot be denied that the death rate, the fatality rate is much lower in South Asia, Southeast Asia compared to Western Europe and, uh, and, and US. So in all of the studies that you covered, the main thing that they're looking at is the adaptive immune response, looking at the T and uh, B cells and whether you have reactivity against the coronavirus. There seem to be few, if any, or have there been any studies looking at the innate immune response? No, actually, I've been asking people, I've been asking friends who have access to samples both in India and US and, and other places to actually look at that. So, uh, you know, simply, if you take blood cells from people from India and US, for example, and you challenge them with uh, a virus, let's say COV-2 virus, what type of cytokines do they produce? What is the, I mean, you can quantitate cytokines very easily these days. Uh, what, uh, are there really significantly different levels that you see between India and, and US? Uh, I have been talking to some some friends uh, to do these sorts of studies. Yeah. So the other question is the uh, is there are several questions which have come in both from YouTube as well as Zoom. So I will first take some of those before I come back to some others which I had myself. So um, Naseem Akhtar asks: Are the DNA vaccines under trial multivalent? And if not, can, can a vaccine be developed using many antigens in one? And, you know, obviously there would be value in that, especially in the context of your talk where you talked about T cell activation. Yeah. I guess theoretically, yes. But uh, remember that for human use today, there is not even a single DNA vaccine that has been licensed. Uh, so let's start uh, Let's learn to crawl before we run. Yes, absolutely. What you said is, is true. You can do that. But we need to uh, really take baby steps here. Okay. So the next question, which comes from Nitya Bhatt, is 
is is question which says that the, and since you've shown us that the antibodies uh, sort of fall off every three or four months, do you anticipate therefore that you need to uh, take a vaccine booster every three or four months? And a related question is that how valuable are the zero surveys if people's you know antigen titers are going to go away in three months or so or shorter depending on how severe your initial infection is, is that a good measure of how much infection our population has seen? Yeah, so, so there are actually two questions here. Yeah. When I talked about antibody waning off, I talked about the neutralizing total of Remember, out of the total food antibody, there is a neutralizing antibody. So the graph that I showed you looked at neutralizing potential of CIRA from patients. So it's the thing that is about three to four months. There are other antibodies that are probably going to stay longer, but also realize that you know this demi cycle. So obviously we can't do a one-year follow-up. Those studies are ongoing. They will. You know, produce result. Point we know that neutralizing antibodies in off in about three to four months. But look at the data. It's confidence that there will be a robust memory response, and the next time somebody goes to virus, this memory response will kick in and quickly produce both antibodies and. So many of the studies are to be done in long follow-ups. The second question was about zero survey and if antibodies vein off, should we even do zero survey? But again, I'll come back and say those are neutralizing antibodies. You know, when you do a zero survey, you look for total IgG. Mm -hmm. uh, and that has value because it tells you what percent of your population got infected. So that's all the zero survey tells you. And it helps you prepare. Uh, so, for example, if if containment zones, and I've read uh, other zero surveys that have not been released but have sort of been leaked in the press, certain clusters in Ahmedabad have uh, more than forty percent zero positivity. Uh, so that tells you that you know in some of these clusters you may actually be getting closer to herd immunity. So it helps you plan. I see. So um, there are a bunch of questions about plasma therapy. And so I sort of roll that all into one saying that, um, what is the current status of uh, plasma therapy? Is this going to actually create problems with the person who's infected's own immune response to the disease? And is that something that we should keep in mind? Yeah, so plasma therapy comes with a lot of caveats. Uh, Plasma therapy response has been very mixed in people. Some people have recovered with one unit of plasma. Others have not recovered even with two, three units of plasma. Uh, so I feel one something that is not happening is to test whether the plasma has neutralizing antibodies or not. Uh, if you're going to be measuring total anti total anti cov two IgG, you don't know how much of that is neutralizing, and since there is no commercially available test for measuring uh, neutralizing antibodies, uh, you know many of these studies are not being done. Uh, so we are sort of flying blind as far as plasma therapy is concerned. The second fact is that it's been shown that people who get severe disease produce the best plasma. Mm -hmm. People who get the severe disease are also not in a good position to donate plasma two weeks after they recover. So again, most of the plasma you are getting is from people who had mild infection. So again, you're back to the quality of antibodies in those plasma. So that's a variable that one must uh, consider here. And of course, plasma is limiting. But there is, there is sound scientific evidence for plasma. You know, passive immunization has gone on for ages. Uh, 
Yeah, so there, there is nothing wrong with it. It's just that, you know, you need better testing of blood. So coming back again to the immune response, and I'd like your comment on this. There's been a lot of press at some point that the mortality seen in men versus women is different. Um, do you think that some of that might stem from the innate immune response? Does that give you automatically looking at what data is out there? If you bisect them by sex, do you have some insights that can be gained? Uh, honestly, I don't know. I don't think those kind of studies, I mean, innate immune response studies haven't really been done very well. So forget about men versus women. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's quite clear that men get far more severe infection compared to women. And that may be linked to sex hormones some way. Uh, maybe there is a role of sex hormones in the expression of the ACE2 receptor on cells. Uh, so uh, men get a higher dose of virus getting into cells and therefore producing a, a much higher dose uh, compared to women. I mean, all these are conjectures really at this point. I'm, I'm not aware of studies that have really addressed this. Um, so then the other question uh, which you also mentioned is uh, about the human beta coronaviruses which cause cold and these groups of people who who are unexposed to the coronavirus, uh, to the SARS-CoV-2, and still had T cells which could sort of respond. Mm -hmm. Do you think that this is coming from these earlier human cold viruses? Is anything known about the prevalence of the beta uh, coronaviruses which cause cold in South Asian populations or in India at all? Yeah, it's, uh, it's estimated that about 20% uh, of the colds that we get every year are accounted for by these uh, you know, coronaviruses. Uh, so there is, and that's in India as well? This is no, not, it's, it's not just in India. It's not just in India. Uh, it's everywhere. So uh, yes, I mean, people who have published these papers also say that, that the only reasonable explanation for seeing T cell reactivity in patients who have not been exposed either to SARS-1 or SARS-2 is that they have been exposed to related beta coronaviruses. So there are lots of questions about, should we be worrying about the vaccine? How many doses is the virus going to change? And we'll have to, you know, not, do we have to worry about that? So I'll sort of roll that all into ones. We know that the SARS cov uh, 2 is undergoing changes in sequence as it spreads across the human population. And um, is that something which should be a concern, both in the nature of the immune uh, response that we make, as well as for vaccines? Yeah, so uh, it's true that viruses change. It's also true that RNA viruses change much faster than DNA viruses. But it's, it's a fact that coronaviruses are the only family of RNA viruses that actually carry proofreading activity, which means that they don't change as quickly as other RNA viruses. So if you, are, if you look at the rate of mutation uh, and compare an influenza virus uh, to a coronavirus, influenza virus mutates about a thousand times faster than a coronavirus on an average. So that's good. Having said that, there is a major uh, variant that has uh, emerged. And this is a variant that has essentially taken over the world. About two thirds of the viruses circulating have a mutation in the spike protein, which is called a D614G variant, which converts uh, aspartic acid to a glycine. But thankfully this, uh, mutation has happened outside the receptor binding domain. It's actually close to a region which is called the hinge region where two parts of the spike protein come together. And when the hinge region is cleaved, that allows fusion of the virus to the cell membrane and entry of the virus. So it is thought that this mutation replacing a negatively charged amino acid with a neutral amino acid which 
which has no backbone, glycine, uh, no side chain, sorry, uh, leads to a more flexible hinge region and that hinge region can be cleaved much more easily. It also, people have also modeled it to show that because of this, you can have many more spike trimers on the surface of uh, the COV-2 virus compared to the COV-1 virus, okay? So more spike, more chances of the spike contacting an ACE2 receptor getting into the cell. So what this mutation has done is to increase the transmissibility of the virus, mm -hmm. but it doesn't really have any bearing on uh, the neutralizing antibodies and therefore, people feel that uh, whatever vaccines are being made, either with the D subtype, D type or the G type, it won't make any difference. Uh, but yes, I mean, we have to keep track of the viruses as they emerge. And if there are viruses emerging, which have uh, you know, mutations in the spike region, then we should be concerned. This is something that usually happens after a vaccine is introduced. There will be some viruses that will escape the vaccine and they will escape by mutating the receptor binding domain. So wait for it, it's coming. It's just not, just not there yet. You're making the case right now, Shahid, for having the old fashioned technology of, you know, taking a weakened strain and, you know, heat it up and inject it rather than those having... Are, honestly, those are the best vaccines. Yes, you those just... are the best vaccines. So let me ask you a couple of two, three last questions. The first is... Um, oh dear, it just sort of vanished. What do you think about human challenge trials and that are being thought about uh, in this in this emergency situation? What's your view about it? Is it ethically safe? Well, it's not ethically safe. Uh, and, you know, human challenge studies, there is a case for those studies, for those viruses, for those diseases, for which there is a cure. So uh, they have been done for malaria, for example. Malaria has no good animal model. Uh, so the only way you could test the efficacy is to go into humans. And if you did it, if you did a, a population trial, it takes too many people, takes too long because people have to get naturally infected. So this idea has been floated around for human trial, human challenge trial. But remember, malaria has very good drugs that can cure your malaria as soon as you, know, you, you get fever. We don't really understand this virus fully yet. Uh, we don't have any specific drug for this virus. Yes, remdesivir has worked to some extent, favipravir has worked to some extent, hydroxychloroquine has worked to some extent, but can you tell me of one drug which is a short, short cure for this virus? There isn't any. Not yet. So I really don't think that there is a very strong case for human challenge trials. Uh, people are discussing it, uh, I really don't feel that there is a strong case for it in this case. So the next question in this direction, less about the science is, um, what do you think are going to be the challenges that we as a nation are going to face in the rollout of the vaccine? Definitely there's a vaccine that's going to come. No, vaccine will come. Vaccine yeah. will come, so, it will and not. Then that's yeah. going, we're going to have a whole another set of considerations for mm -hmm. How many, who gets it, when they get it, etc. Yeah. What are your thoughts on that? So a vaccine will come out. It will not come out by August 15th, but a vaccine will come out. The earliest a safe vaccine will be licensed and approved is possibly going to be by the end of this year. I cannot see a vaccine being tested for efficacy and getting approval before that. Now, the next stage is manufacture of the vaccine. And at the manufacture level, I think India is quite well placed. Uh, there are a couple of Indian companies that are really 
there to have set up facilities in advance. So for example, Serum Institute has set up a facility to produce uh, about 1 billion doses of the Oxford vaccine. And they're hoping that this vaccine will be proven efficacious. They have been given permission also to produce small lots of this vaccine so that they can be tested in India. Remember phase one and phase two has already been done. Uh, India will have to do a phase three before this vaccine is licensed in India. And Serum is planning to do those trials, starting those trials in August sometime. Okay. Out of the 1 billion dose capacity at Serum for this vaccine, about uh, you know, 70% will be for India. About 30% will go to Gavi, which is a coalition that serves the needs of the poorest nations in the world. So it's good that an Indian company is doing that and we should be awfully proud of the fact. Uh, I don't know how much uh, capacity Bharat has to make the inactivated vaccine. I have not come across numbers. So I think we'll be in, in decent shape as far as we are concerned as a country. But if, the, if we believe that we will be, you know, prioritized and given the vaccine as soon as it comes out, it won't happen. As the vaccine comes out, it will be reserved. The, the first people to get it would be the healthcare workers who are really at the front line. They will be security uh, personnel, people who have other morbidities, uh, people who are, you know, beyond a certain age. Uh, so the young India is going to be the last one to get it. So uh, yes, we are. It, you know, it's looking decent, but don't you know, wait for a vaccine to protect you. You need to be protected today. That's really the message I want to give. So but we, you, know, you know, the fact is that, you know, we have so many vaccines so quickly. Yes. And exactly. that's really something to celebrate. And that's really a celebration of science and celebration of, of all the research that has gone on. So we'll wrap up with the final question which is a more general question. We've had other pandemics in the world. The HIV is one and we still have a TB, I think it's pretty much there uh, to stay. And what are the lessons that we should or have learned from previous pandemics that um, have not been applied well or are being applied well to this um, COVID-19 pandemic? Well, why just this COVID-19 pandemic? I mean, the, the world has been, I mean, scientists have been saying for more than a decade that uh, new viruses are emerging, uh, they are jumping into human populations and we must do something about them. It took a pandemic for us to pay attention to that. You know, over the last 50 years, 75% of emerging diseases have emerged from animals. So we have to pay attention to the increasing animal-human contact, which is happening because of deforestation, which is happening because of global warming. You know, those are things that we don't see. We see it only when a pandemic comes. So I, I, I think the other lesson which uh, possibly all of us have learned, is that we were doing many things that are really not needed. You know, in my job, I used to travel about 10 to 15 days a month. I have not traveled since the end of February. And it has made no difference to the work that I do to my productivity. So I think all of us need to look back and assess our lifestyle and see what we were doing uh, and how we should progress in future. Uh, I mean, I have read reports saying that, uh, you know, the way uh, global, you know, the ice caps are melting at the poles. Uh, 
you don't know what that will bring out. The, uh, the Alaskan permafrost already brought out uh, anthrax, which has been there for you know, a couple of hundred years. And it actually caused, caused an outbreak and killed people. But that was anthrax, that was a bacterial infection, a known bacterial infection could be controlled. What if an unknown virus emerges uh, from these locations because of global warming? People have done these studies and looked at 1500 year old ice cores from glaciers. And that has shown that about two thirds of the viruses found there are unknown to, to us. We don't know what they are. So I think we need to be paying very close attention to our environment. We need to be keeping ourselves prepared. The pandemic is a good time to, you know, to sort of understand these things and attack these things. But pandemic is not a good time to prepare. You don't prepare for a war while the war is on. You prepare in peacetime. And we seem to be forgetting that fundamental lesson. So I, I hope that our policymakers are, you know, will look at it that way and will continue to invest in science and will continue to invest in our future. So on that note, thank you, Shahid. We need to prepare in peacetime and really need to think about Absolutely. the climate, global warming and other issues. Yeah. I thank all of you who came. I'm sorry, there were 32 questions in the Q&A box and a huge number which came in through the chat. It was impossible to take them all. Please sign in again when we advertise our next webcam seminar. We aim to sort of give good scientific information in an accessible manner to people who are scientists, be they biologists or not. And thank you again, Shahid. Thank you, Sandhya. Thank you. I'm closing Thank the call. Thank you.